So I'd like to welcome onto the stage my first guest. So um, Amy Brogland peterson Professor of Supply Chain Management at Michigan State University. Um, Amy is also a principal consultant at Winex Global Advisory. Welcome, Amy. Thank you. And has more than 20 years' experience in supply chain and purchasing roles, uh, including at Ford, American Axel, Bosch, and several major 3PLs. So welcome, Amy. Thank you. And last, uh, certainly not least, uh, we also have uh, Matt Pullman. Uh, many of you will know Matt. Uh, he's now CEO of the Automotive Industry Action Group, uh, an important nonprofit organization driving industry collaboration uh, and standards across quality supply chain and logistics uh, and corporate responsibility. Uh, whilst relatively new to his role uh, at AIAG, he has over 40 years' experience uh, of automotive supply chain management. Uh, including leadership roles at major tier one suppliers, including Delphi, ZF, uh, Federal Mogul, uh, and a few more besides. So welcome to my panel once again. Um. So as I've just laid out, um, clearly you both have uh, impressive track records, impressive career histories uh, in logistics and supply chain, progressing through uh, various leadership roles, uh, automotive, major automotive companies. Um, what got you into the industry in the first place? Uh, and, and do the same opportunities that you saw and had still, uh, still lie in place? So Matt, I'm going to come to you first. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Good to be here. Um, when I started working, I was not in the supply chain at all. I was in a sales role uh, for Fred Mogul. I was in sales for 10 years, uh, moving around different sales jobs, probably complaining a lot about the, the supply chain and, and why we didn't get material. Uh, but uh, I had a job switch. Uh, a, a boss changed when I was running a call center, and I went to, to, to more in the operation side, and from there, um, started running warehousing distribution sites, uh, moved to Europe, did a bunch of other things, and uh, I haven't been able to get out of it. I've enjoyed it. Uh, it's been a, a, a great ride. I think the, the first 10 years of sales has tremendously helped me uh, over the next 30 years of supply chain uh, challenges in the industry. But uh, to your later question, uh, is it still the same or is it the same challenges? I think the opportunities are there uh, are great in the supply chain space today. Uh, we've never had the visibility we have today. Uh, it's at the C-suite side relative to what supply chain is. Uh, I think there's a tremendous opportunity, and I'm sure we'll talk about that today, uh, for new talent to, to be brought in. There's a shift in talent happening, a shift in expectations within the supply chain. But we have ever-facing challenges. We, there's a significant uh, opportunity for change. You're always de involved with some kind of change when you're in supply chain space. So uh, I do think there's opportunities today for young people to join the organizations uh, in a supply chain role. Yeah, excellent. Well, it's good to start on a very positive note. So thank you for that. Uh, Amy, a little bit about your, uh, your journey. Yeah, well, thank you, first of all, for uh, having me up here today. It's great to be here. Um, so it's kind of in my blood. I was the fourth generation in my family to work in automotive. Um, and uh, so I kind of, from a, a young age, had a father and a grandfather and a great-grandfather who were all involved in some way, shape, or form with automotive purchasing and logistics. Um, so I kind of knew I wanted to do that. Uh, but to Matt's point, and I think he summarized so so well, you know, what what's kept me in it over the years is... There's no day that's the same. The change is constant um, and can be, you know, rather addictive. The excitement of just a, a different day ahead every day and a new challenge to overcome. And um, so it's, it's been a great, a great ride so far and, uh, you know, look forward to years to come, hopefully, in, in the industry. Yeah, fantastic. And, uh, yeah, I think um, everyone I've spoken to is certainly a sucker for punishment um, who uh, thrives, thrives in this scenario. Um, it, it takes a special, take a special breed of person to relish the, uh, the challenges, the opportunities, um, the supply chain, uh, not least now. But automotive supply chain, no stranger to a crisis. As we say, every day can be different. Um, but in the past couple of years, uh, there's been... Well, over periods of time, there's been 
periods of calm, um, it's been cyclical, um, crisis in isolation. Uh, now there's continuous pressure, multiple crises um, to manage an enduring level of disruption uh, and seemingly no end in sight. So for leaders and their teams, uh, is the current way the sector works sustainable uh, without service levels dropping? Um, and how is this sort of new normal landscape that we're in of this constant disruption you know, what's the impact of those working in the industry? <laughs> the, um, I, there's never been the pressure there is today. Uh, that's clear. Uh, and it's, uh, um, it's causing, I think, everyone to rethink uh, how they run their supply chains and how they're managing the supply chains. Uh, and there's a great deal of stress. But sometimes when there's stress, I'll try to keep it on the positive side. There's the ability now with the extra focus I mentioned earlier at the C-suite, but uh, but everywhere. I mean, I mean, when I first started taking supply chain roles, nobody knew what supply chain was, and and now uh, even my mother uh, is reading about it, and and she's telling me about different disruptions before I even read about it. So I think it it's clearly uh, in the forefront, and I think um, the ability. Uh, that that has is, 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 is quite broad. So I think while there's disruptions and it's difficult and it's challenging, I also think that in many cases, the, the right companies are using this time, uh, I mean, we're scrambling to try to get stuff in and, and get it fixed, but as they're doing that, they're reevaluating their supply chains, they're, they're looking at nearshoring, they're looking at what can they do from a te technology standpoint, uh, I know in the past when there was investment needed or when you needed some type of uh, financial support, often the supply chain was one of the last places that had ever happened. Now, because of the focus on supply chain, because of disruptions, because of how the, the, uh, the supply chains lengthened, it's now getting shorter again, or at least people are evaluating, can it be shorter? What kind of investments can we make and all those other types of things? So I think there's an opportunity now with all of this f pressure and heat to, to reevaluate and reinvest in, in, in redesign the, uh, uh, the organization that you're in to, a, to the new type of supply chain that is evolving. You know, it's fantastic, and we do appreciate your mother's subscription to <laughs> our, uh, our weekly newsletter. <laughs> I, um, I did send her the, the announcement you put out there, so uh, she's looking at it. Yeah, <laughs> uh, that's fantastic, and you're all welcome if you haven't signed up, of course. So, <laughs> um, to that point, uh, Change is coming, uh, and the long-term view for the industry uh, is seemingly very positive. You know, we've had um, expert analysis on, uh, about the growth of the industry, the rapid rise of electric vehicles, um, the growth in that space, the battery production line, um, regionalization, nearshoring, as, as you mentioned, Matt, um, a commitment to increasing the U.S. manufacturing uh, footprint, uh, as well as the supply chain to, to support it. Um, so how will, how will the industry be able to cope with that scale um, and that scaling up where it's already seemingly quite stretched, where there are labor shortages, there is labor supply challenges, um, be it from warehouses to truck drivers um, through to mineral management. Um, how can the industry prepare for that growth um, so the logistics and supply chain organizations and sector can meet the needs of that growing footprint? Amy, I'll come to you. Yeah, so I, you know, was actually just uh, speaking with some individuals in the audience here before we started and um, was mentioning to them that it used to be, you would see a lot of the automotive companies, the OEMs, the suppliers at career fairs and things, um, but more so now than ever, we're seeing forwarders and transport providers actively recruiting supply chain talent, um, even right out of college. And I think that's a really exciting place to start. Um, you know, the transportation industry just being what it is with the, uh, the global nature, but the increasing prevalence and importance in, in the place of the supply chain, um, it's huge, right? And so preparing for the need for this talent, I mean, obviously it, it starts with um, companies like this that are hiring and training. I, I often laugh and tell students in supply chain that it really doesn't matter what I put up on the board or try to lecture on, you learn by doing, right? And so when you get out there and you start doing these things in the real world, that's when you truly begin to um, paint the picture of an end-to-end -end supply chain 
and the various pieces and how they work and come together. So um, preparing for the, the future workforce and the growth in all this space, uh, you know, obviously at Michigan State, we're, we're doing a lot to build our talent, build our program, which has always been strong, but, uh, you know, in the world, there are so many emerging supply chain programs in general. Um, almost every university I can think of has either started a program or will be starting one soon. Um, so there's a huge pipeline of talent coming. I know right now, I, I think we're still kind of in the gap years. Um, but I'm very excited about the future, and I think we'll be well-equipped to handle supply chain challenges with the different um, student populations across the U.S. especially. Yeah, I, I think the supply chain industry, the automotive supply chain industry, has been dealing with this for a long time. Uh, it, it's, uh, you know, we've had to expand. There was a big expansion when they started going from, say, the U.S. to expanding into Mexico. There was a lot of people in doing it. I think one of the things, or, or expanding to China, there was a lot of those activities. I, when, the, when I think when that was happening, uh, there was a lot of companies did that mostly themselves. They maybe had consultants, but they were doing a lot of those those activities themselves. Uh, and the moves took longer, the activities uh, took longer, a vehicle was in production a lot longer. Uh, I, I think what I see changing right now is the speed with which change is happening. Uh, not only the speed of new uh, suppliers coming on board, new manufacturers coming on board, new tiers coming on board, also all of the tiers, all of the suppliers within the industry. I think it's changing so fast. I see one of the big changes is is companies aren't doing as much themselves anymore. They're involving others. They're involving their partners. They're involving the next tier. They're involving service providers and, and, and outsourcing uh, providers to do those things, to try to, to go faster, to try to rely on somebody else to help with different pieces of that. And I think as that is evolving, I think there's also uh, a requirement now for better partnerships, better long-term partnerships, better communications, and I think with all of that happening at the same time, there's also now this, uh, this speed of, uh, of all the technology that's coming in to help the industry relative to robotics, uh, whether, relative to the, to the visibility tools that are happening out there. I th so I think the, uh, and that's gonna drive new students and new people into the industry. So I think there's a, there's a lot of things, but I think we've always been doing it. I think it's evolving to be a much faster piece. We're gonna have new players involved. And I think the speed of that, uh, it's going to require us to do more with, uh, with others. Yeah, excellent. And um, you mentioned you know, technology there. So I'm interested to um, hear from you in, in terms of you know, how the skill sets of the modern, uh, yeah, how the skill sets of the modern day um, logisticians, supply chain professionals, how you see them evolving, they're changing. Um, and Amy, I'll start with you perhaps in terms of, you talked about these uh, the supply chain management programs and schools coming through at the universities. How are you preparing the students, the next generation um, to be equipped? What skill sets are you equipping them with? So resiliency, risk management, um, you know, the ability to map out a supply chain, understand the points of risk, contingency plan and, you know, mitigation planning and things like that are huge. Um, if, you know, anybody learns anything over the past two years, right, you, you've got to have a plan and be proactively managing your risk um, or you risk the, you know, the, the face of shutting down. Um, so we, we work a lot on that. We talk a lot about sustainability and, um, you know, that's a, a growing piece of the role of a supply chain professional uh, that we work with the students on gearing up for. Um, but really data, data analytics, um, and the technology side, as Matt said, is, is huge, right? And, and you almost can't keep pace with, with what's out there and, you know, we're, we're kind of just like our phones, we're antiquated with our knowledge within a very short period of, of time, but um, preparing them to not just be logisticians, but also, you know, really true analysts with data and the ability to convert that data into meaningful insights to use for strategic purposes and strategy making and things like that. Um, you know, we talk a lot about automation and look at the various pieces of automation in a supply chain, increasingly so in the warehousing and distribution space. Um, you know, that's, that's not going to go away. That will only continue to grow. 
And I, I tell the students, you know, we don't need to be afraid of things like automation, especially in certain places like warehouses. It's not a place where a lot of people want to work. It's not a great environment. Um, and, and, you know, the, the automation that's taking place in those environments is uh, yielding huge gains, right? So the ability to understand that automation, the various systems behind it and how it all works, and, uh, and kind of use that as they're going into organizations who, frankly, many are still at the very early cusps of building up a, a digitization type of strategy. And, um, you know, they're very much expected to play a pretty big role in that in their careers and early in their careers. So those are some of the things we, we look at in, in our program and curriculum. Yeah, excellent, thank you. Yeah. Uh, and, and Matt, um, perhaps you can share some details on, on the AIAG programs you're running um, that support uh, skill development and leadership development, um, be it for those already in industry or, or those coming through. Can you, can you expand on those a little bit? Yeah, AIAG is, a, is an industry group supporting the um, automotive industry, the uh, mobile industry, uh, we're there to help drive standardization and common processes and then writing the procedures around that. Uh, one of the requests that we've had, uh, and I'm new in, in, into this role, uh, but one of the requests that our board of directors has asked us to get involved in is helping train new people and helping train uh, people they have within their supply chain. So we have a program that we developed a few years ago uh, to get a certification at Wayne State uh, on, on uh, supply chain and purchasing uh, pieces. So there, there's a, there's a uh, several, uh, several months long program to get certified there. We're expanding that and looking to work with some other universities and community colleges to do that. Uh, we also have a uh, program called uh, Tomorrow's Leaders Today that uh, we're just launching right now. In fact, in October is the first piece of that. Again, we're working with Wayne State on that. But that's with uh, any of our uh, over 4,000 members uh, can participate in that. And then uh, what we do with that is, uh, in fact, Tate, I think, is here. Uh, I was just introduced to her earlier today. And she uh, was just excited. She's been asked by General Motors to be part of that and represent General Motors at that class. Uh, and, uh, but again, it's designed to take, say, high potential supply chain folks, bring them into a setting, uh, over over six different courses uh, and help develop them in supply chain and leadership, many of the pieces that you would want to help develop somebody. We give them a project within those companies and then uh, over the course of uh, the, the first year, have them take a project uh, and then with some mentoring and support, help them de uh, and then come back and present on the project that they're doing as well. But it's a development program. We also have an e-learning program that the board has asked us to put together. Uh, we have, uh, uh, we're known for the quality and those types of things we do. We also have supply chain, but we also have corporate responsibility, which is, is a, a lot of the social responsibility that you have within a company. We've got an e-learning program that we're in the final stages of developing. And that's where, again, where member companies uh, can, can participate in that. And it's, there's a, the ability uh, for companies to track who's done that to allow uh, yourself to be, uh, um, have the ability to say, we've taken, uh, people from our company have taken these e-learning courses uh, and uh, they've, they've passed the courses and then there's the ability to, to report uh, on all the reporting places that you need to do to be, uh, to be accountable for that. So I think that, uh, so we're, and we've got a tremendous demand for support on developing people and we're trying to figure out how do we do that. You know, a comprehensive program there, um, accessible to, to the industry, fantastic. Um, what does the modern day leader look like, or what should the modern day supply chain and logistics leader look like? Um, is there a greater focus on the, the softer side, the human factor within this, um, or is it all about the KPIs, getting through the, the tough times in the crunch? Um, I think it's, it's uh, I don't know, I think there's uh, the ability, the leader today uh, has to be uh, multi-suited for things that they've had responsibility for. So I, I, I don't think you can start out in warehousing and just go very vertical in warehouses and be a full supply chain leader. Um, I think you have to have experience cross-functionally on many areas, whether it's purchasing, 
warehousing, manufacturing. I think it's very important for any leader to have gone to the floor and know how to you know, go to Gemba, learn how to run the shop floor, learn how to run that. But whether it's uh, purchasing, inventory, transportation, customs, there should be a full understanding of having many of those things on someone's belt because then you can understand the full gamut of that. You can have a specialty in one of those areas or not. But I think the leader today needs to have that full responsibility. I think it's helped me a great deal having had the 10 years of sales experience. That's also helped me in, in my background understand that important front end piece. But uh, I also think you have to have uh, some technology in your background. I think it's uh, uh, it's, 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 an, it's important to have an understanding of technology and how that can help you. Uh, I think you have to have the skill of being able to partner uh, with others on the outside. Uh, but uh, I think it's evolving today. The managers of the old days where you just barked out rules and told people, I think you were referring to that earlier when you were saying that, but I think that uh, the, the employees today want to have a lot more ownership into what their day looks like and how you're doing it. So I think there's a, there's a transition right now happening in the, in the, in the market, uh, and we have to figure out how to manage this, this newer workforce that's coming at us, and I think that's still evolving. Absolutely. Uh, I want to do a quick um, audience poll, just uh, for something we touched upon yesterday's session. And just by a show of hands, um, who intentionally got into automotive logistics and supply chain in this room? <laughs> OK. Uh, and who didn't, just so I <laughs> OK. So the majority didn't. OK, I should probably put my hand up as well. Um, I wanted to be a dancer. Um, so, hoisted by my own petard here. Um, yeah, just to, just to make the point that we heard yesterday is uh, the route into logistics supply chain is perhaps not a, a natural choice. Um, and yet here we are, and people have had some fantastic, exceptional careers, um, uh, loving what they do. Um, Matt, you alluded to... Uh, the, the need for today's leaders or, or tomorrow's leaders to have um, a varied roles, um, sight of, of many of the operations and, um, and functions across the supply chain to, to really get an understanding of it. It's such a complex environment. What, is the, what does the career path look like? And is that, um, that complexity a real barrier? Is there enough transparency into what that career path might be like, whether it's someone already in the industry looking to take the next step or someone looking to get into it? Amy, I'll start with you. Yeah, so, you know, I, I think there's huge opportunity to, um, you know, to be frank, to do a little bit stronger in this area, right? So a lot of uh, students, and, and when I was coming up and starting out in the industry, um, you know, I had a couple of internships, but it was very different than what, uh, what a, our students experience today. Um, I think that young people want to understand, you know, where they can go in a company. They're eager to try and do different things. Um, and so gone are the days maybe where you can plop someone in a cube and stick the same title on them for five years un, un, unanswered, right, on, on a career track. Um, I think it's, it's pertinent to give some visibility into what you know, is being done organizationally to round out uh, different professionals, right, especially in the supply chain space. I agree wholeheartedly with Matt that, um, you know, to really understand end-to-end -end supply chain and therefore be a part of a strategy in that direction, you have to spend time doing all those things, right? And so for our young, young people starting a career, um, you know, we, we organizationally should be developing tracks where we're rotating and we have, you know, a very structured program. I think that also helps with retention, right? So securing talent is one thing, keeping talent is a different, a uh, whole different ball game. And so this is some of the, the things that I would say our uh, younger set is looking for when they start with a company is, you know, I, I can start here, but where can I go from here and where can I grow from here, right? Um, and then over time, how can I find a path and work through and check all these boxes to end up in, in a leadership role of strategic importance, right? Um, so, so I think there's opportunity there. You know, many companies have very good programs with that. Um, 
Some companies, not as much, you know, but it's never too late to start. Uh, and I think it's it's better. It's a win-win for everybody, right? You 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 need well-developed supply chain talent. Clearly, that's why I've, a lot of people are sitting here right now. Um, and you're only going to get it if you're moving those people through the different roles. Operations is huge. So few people spend time getting their hands dirty, but yet I would say that's one of the best ways to learn supply chain, right? And it's it's better to do it when you're younger than than older too, so, um, you know, I think there's, there's a, a huge need and opportunity to really drive a, a structured program in, in companies. Um, and I don't know if Matt has anything to add on this. But no, it's just, it's, it's a challenge, right? The development uh, is, is very hard. I think having a well-defined plan uh, that says you need to do these various things, these six things, these seven things, uh, and then have it be flexible enough that it's not you're going to go A, B, C, D, you might go A, D, E, but, and the person has to be flexible. Again, it's uh, these, uh, being in the supply chain is not, uh, is not built for everybody, right? Uh, there's a, you got to have thick skin and you got to be able to manage things, but I think there's a lot to do and I think it's going to be evolving. I think we have to continue to find a way to learn. You know, I listened to the, the women's forum uh, group that you had here yesterday, and they talked about the need for mentoring uh, and, uh, and many things. I think uh, there is a need for mentoring uh, young people uh, and, uh, and giving them advice. Uh, and I, I do that myself with multiple people. And I think it's a, it's a way to help develop people uh, and uh, give them confidence in, in their career and whatnot and help them with decisions and you can't give them the answers. You gotta just kinda advise and, and let them speak their answers and they'll, make, they'll say what they need but it, it just takes time sometimes for them to understand that. But, but having a plan, uh, I, and I read a re, a, an article recently that uh, the, it's shifting from people being described themselves as here's the job that I have, which is probably how I was in this industry a long time, versus here's who I am and here's kind of the job that I do. Uh, and that's a big difference. Uh, and how, how that perception is, is a big difference on how you will have to manage people. And I think it's important for us to try to understand those changes and those shifts uh, because it's a different management style to manage somebody that's more interested about who they are uh, and the job that they do because they want different things. They might want more flexibility in, in, in different stages of, the, of, of their career path. So again, we have to identify that and adjust and and younger people might have to adjust to the business life as well, but it, I think it's a learning curve all the way around. Yeah, absolutely, and you, and you say we have to listen to the next generation, to what they want, um, and we do have some students in the room, and I would love to hear from you. Um, so my, uh, my glamorous assistant has a, a microphone <laughs> at hand. Um, so yeah, we'd love to hear, hear your thoughts on, you know, what are your expectations? Um, what are you looking for in a, in a career um, moving forward? Um, so if anyone's brave enough or everyone feels comfortable enough, we'd love to hear from you and, and get your input, so. Excellent. It's a good thing I ran track when I was young. <laughs> it's not like you've been running a conference for two days, Chris. No, that, that's easy stuff. <laughs> Up here? Yeah. Okay. Uh, my name is Sydney. I uh, just graduated from Wayne State uh, this past May. Um, so to answer your question of what kind of new graduates in this next generation of the workforce are looking for, um, like you guys said, visibility, um, where I can go from here, uh, is this a basic path for where I want to be within the next five years? Um, and I think it was mentioned yesterday too that not a lot of people stick with companies for 25, 30 plus years, kind of jump around to kind of get the best of your skill sets and gain more knowledge. Um, so with that, yeah, I, I personally um, am definitely looking for something that can get me on the path that um, I'm looking for. And yeah, I would say visibility and transparency uh, is the most important right now. Yeah, thank you very much. And, and congratulations as well uh, on, on graduating. So that's uh, fantastic news. And um, you know, we look forward to having you on the panel uh, in the coming years as our, as our keynote speaker. Um, but joking aside, thank you very much for your answer, and you know, that's really critical. Uh, understanding what um, people want out of their job, I think uh, 
you know, even on a personal journey, what the pandemic has changed um, in terms of the desires, the needs from uh, the work-life relationship. I think that's something that everyone can relate to. Um, but having that clearer picture uh, is really valuable to, uh, to have. So yeah, any, any comments on that? Yeah, you know, I, I, we were talking about um, and some of the soft factors, right, and leadership, and uh, to your point about um, the pandemic and work-life work balance, and, you know, we, we again have huge opportunity to really step back and look at the workplace um, and what we thought it was versus what it, it truly can become, right? And so, you know, the, the metric of how many hours spent at the office or at a desk, I hope, is gone. Um, because frankly, that was never the right metric to begin with. Um, you know, the, the, the outcomes, the performance, the objectives, the things that you want to accomplish um, and how people are aligning with that, I think is, is critical. So kind of redefining work um, you know, it, it, it's a huge part of your identity, but you're also a human, right? And you have moments in your lives where you, you need that human side to come first, and um, companies need to be adapting to that, right? I, like I told you, you know, if, if, you're, if your policies are such that they can <laughs> make people cry at times, right, um, then, then it's it's time to draw those up again, right? And, and really look at what you want out of your people um, and, and how you're supporting them in that way. And so things like maternity policies and bereavements and you know, life events, um, you know, how are you supporting people when they need support as well? Uh, so it goes both ways. And I think luckily, you know, if there's any gain from a pandemic, which there's a few things that it's, I wouldn't say been good for, right? But we've all learned probably some lessons. Um, one of those things is just that, you know, people can be very productive and very reliable in and out of an office and still help us, you know, not just achieve but really exceed our goals. And I think in supply chain, <laughs> you guys, I mean, you're doing this all the time, right? You're, you're probably very tired. It's been a few trying years. Um, so, you know, the, the need for management now more than ever to really take that human side and, and approach is very critical uh, as well. Yeah, and I think understanding uh, where you work is important as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you're in an area that, uh, say you're in a customer service area and you can work from home, um, it, you can work from home. Uh, and, and there's ways to make that work. If your job is to do something in a factory or in a warehouse, you probably can't do that from home. We can't pick parts from your house. Um, so it's uh, having, I think, understanding those things are also important. Uh, and when you're in various jobs and when you're rotating through various jobs, there's an expectation that you're going to be at a place doing work. And sometimes I hear, well, I didn't want to do this. And I think it's, there's a good under, you should make sure you're understanding what you're getting into uh, and how long you're going to be there. I think, I think one of the things that, is changing now is that expectation. How do we make sure we outline the expectation? We outline what's, uh, how long it might take. Uh, and then, you know, and then make sure that uh, we're living up to our, our word and the commitments as, as we, as those, as those things happen. And how do you communicate uh, progress on those things? And how do you move within an operation? But I think it's, a, it's an understanding. It, it, it's just not everything is a work from home job today. Uh, in the space that we're in, in the automotive space, um, a lot of it has to be uh, at the operation or at the facility you're in, uh, and it requires work to be done from there. So I think it's you got to let set the ground un, understand the ground rules and expectations as well as important. Yeah, great, thank you. Um, Just, just, to, just to add on, partly from the, the, the comment as well from, from the student, I thought there was a point that was made yesterday in the Women in Supply Chain panel, which applies across the board. It wasn't so specific to women, um, around the defining the path, the career path. And one thing that was recognized was that sometimes 
progression isn't, isn't linear, at least if you're going to develop those rounded skills that you've been talking about. So maybe on paper it might look like, I don't know, going from analyst to planner to manager, etc. But actually along the way you need to, you should go into the warehouse or you should go into the operations. But there's been more effort to start defining the progression path and not not seen backwards, so, um, uh, and, and it would be specific to each company, but the path is there, so you might pivot to a different role, but you're still progressing. And I mean, that, I mean, if someone wants to comment or add to that about from their company experience, please do, but I thought that was a, uh, an interesting point. And then I would throw a question to it, and again, it's either side. So when I was 20 or 21, all I could think about was getting out, seeing the world. Or I would have, you know, just probably why I ended up a journalist uh, in, you know, traveling around so much. Um, you know, I'm, I'm curious if for the younger generations that sense of wanting to be in international locations is still as important. Um, we have some challenges in the world that make some of that harder than maybe it was even, even a couple of years ago. Um, but I know one of the, uh, Kelly Bysouth from IAC, um, I don't think she said it on the panel, but I know she said for her, when she works with her, um, younger, younger staff and they want to develop to be directors or whatever would expect that at least one international posting would be part of that path. Um, so just raising that, interested if, first from the panel's point of view, uh, if that's important in your mind, and, and then I guess if there's anyone in the audience who wants to, to comment on that, then please, please let us know. Thanks, Chris. I would comment on, on the international experience. I have had the blessing to be an expat in three different countries for two different companies. Uh, and. Um, I couldn't be the person I am today without having the international experience. Um, you know, the cultural piece that you learn is so important, uh, especially if you're working in a global company. Understand the different ground rules and, and, and different way of work, how it gets done. Uh, it, just because uh, I learned it this way doesn't mean that's the way it, it necessarily might be the best way. So I, I would say, you know, getting multiple uh, pieces of a tool belt uh, uh, of experience is tremendously important. If you can get cultural experiences as well, those are important. If you can travel, that's great, but traveling is not necessarily living there. It's much more difficult to live there and sustain there. So uh, I would uh, encourage anybody that has the opportunity, if it's unique for you and it fits for you, to take advantage of that. I know my kids are better for making the trip as well. Yeah, I would agree. A global mindset is critical in today's company. and really in the supply chain environment. So um, I would, I'm pretty certain many of the students in, in today's uh, world are really eager to have those types of experiences as well. Yeah, excellent comments. And um, yeah, thanks for raising that, uh, Chris. And of course, that is open to the floor. You know, it's, a, it's an open house, uh, uh, a safe place to you know, share your thoughts. And we'd love to hear from other leaders or other, other students in the, in the audience as well. We have about five minutes to go. So please don't hold back if you would like to share. Um, the industry's changed its priorities, uh, not least when people have changed their own perhaps priorities and reevaluated their own purpose. Um, during these, these difficult last years, we were working from home or, or during the pandemic, um, but the industry priorities and shift towards a greater focus on sustainability um, perhaps offers a chance for the automotive industry to once again connect with the next generation um, who really want to, uh, as I understand it, have a meaningful impact and uh, we're, we're not finished just yet. <laughs> we, can, we, can we pay the electricity bill, please? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Reducing emissions right before your eyes. Absolutely. Um, so if everyone can just get their lighters out, please. Um, no. uh, yeah, so that focus on, on sustainability, is that a chance to, to reconnect with um, next, uh, the next generation in terms of those wanting to make a meaningful impact, um, have a job not just to get money in, to pay the rent, um, but also to serve a purpose? And, you know, are we at a time with electrification, this transition to sustainability, that we're at the precipice of being able to contribute in a really meaningful way? Um, how, how do we maximize that opportunity in terms of talent, drawing that in, retaining it for automotive? I'll start with the panel, but I'm keen to hear from, from students, from, from other leaders as well. I think it depends on what company you're working for. Every, every company that I'm aware of is in a different place of that sustainability path. I, I think, uh, um, 
some things that drive that are legislative mandates and things along that nature. But if, you, if you're in a space that is either being mandated or the company has a drive to make that happen, I, I think there's a, there's a window and an opportunity to be involved in that. Um, I think it's, uh, I do think there's a, the, the new generation is interested in that. We've got to find a way to get them on board uh, and get them roles that can help contribute in that manner. Agree. Yeah, sustainability is a huge initiative and priority for um, younger generations especially, and really all of us, and I don't think that it's going to become any less prominent as time goes on um, in the world. So I know that it's, you know, it's something that when you ask students what they think is, is you know, most critical in a hiring company, many of them are looking for companies that are, you know, striving to be environmentally friendly or reduce carbon footprint or, you know, and, and sustainability comes in other forms, right? Um, using responsible suppliers and, and ensuring, you know, responsibility and ethics throughout your supply chain, exactly. um, safe working conditions, you know, there's, there's lots of uh, opportunity there. Um, so I, I definitely agree, sustainability is, we're kind of at the forefront. Um, and you know, not every company, we're in transportation, right? So we can't be as sustainable as, as maybe we would hope. Um, goods have to be moved. Uh, but there are things companies can do and are doing to kind of help improve and work on those initiatives. And I think a lot of the, the students would love to be a part of um, an organization that really puts that as, as a focus area. Agreed. Yeah, excellent. Um, Ed. Yeah. Um, th this is Dave Leach. I work for General Motors. And just to talk a little bit about that point, um, you know, it's about uh, three, four years ago, we um, kind of identified a, a vision for GM, which we call 000. And it's, uh, it's uh, our vision of um, a world with zero crashes, zero emissions, and zero congestion. And the way that has resonated with the company, within the company, has been absolutely phenomenal. And it really guides, you know, what we work on. And in terms of, you know, the young talent coming into the company, it's, it's really inspiring to them. And so, um, you know, we measure <laughs> our impact on the environment with all the things that we do. And, and it's amazing the momentum you get when you um, really focus on sustainability for the right reasons, not for the regulatory reasons, and the innovation and passion. Um, you know, we have um, volunteer sustainability teams, and the interest is astounding within our organization and the ideas that they come up with. And like in the logistics space, you know, if, if you can shrink your network and your, and your routes, you know, what's the CO2? savings for that you know we ship a lot of cardboard you know that that we can't recycle so there there's there's lots of things we can be doing um, from a sustainability standpoint and it does uh, it definitely resonates the electric piece you know is certainly huge as well and, and we're uh, we're all in on electric from a gm standpoint thanks dave yeah okay. yeah okay. Thank you, David. And I think you know, that's almost a fantastic point to, to end on. Perhaps uh, I will just close out this panel by just asking our panelists, what's your advice? You know, we've, we've covered a lot of ground. We have given a lot of advice already. But just to sort of sum up in, in maybe one, se one sentence or two, um, what's your advice to the aspiring talent out there, to those in, in supply chain living and working every, every single day? Um, Amy, final thoughts? Oh, my students are probably really sick of hearing my <laughs> advice by now. But, um, you know, I, I do really, really have a strong belief in, um, you know, working at the ground level and spending time in operations. Um, I hate to say getting your hands dirty over and over, but truly, you know, that that is where you learn so much about, you know, where the, the rubber meets the road and ultimately all the various activities within a supply chain and how they're they're coming together and, and making or breaking your, your company and your operations. Um, so, you know, do that. Do it when you're young, if you can. Um, it's it's uh, critical. And, um, yeah, have an open mind and be open to new experiences. Great, Amy. The, I, I think I would, I would just say the supply chain space in the automotive space is a great place to be. Uh, I would encourage my own kids uh, and anybody to get into it. It's, uh, we're nowhere near the end. 
Uh, we still have a long journey. There is a technology change and shift that's about to happen that's going to make it extremely exciting. And, and you can be in supply chain and be in data and, and be in electronics and, and, and all of those converging areas and really make a difference uh, in the supply chain space. It's just not moving things or making things. Uh, in that supply chain space, you're looking at all the interconnected pieces. And uh, I think that uh, we're far from having that understood, especially as the new EV uh, world is coming in and all the changes that are gonna come from that. I think we're gonna have a very different supply chain with that in the future. I think companies are designing themselves to have a different path for, for the, 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 the electronic space versus the, the traditional engine space. So I think there's a lot of, a lot of room uh, and growth for a long, uh, sustained career uh, in, the, in this space. So I'm, I'm, I'm excited and encouraged by the people I've met here and the people that are mentor. Uh, I think we've got, the future looks good. Well, that's a perfect way to end this session. So thank you very much to my panel, um, Amy yeah. and Matt. Yes, brilliant. Pleasure. Thank you.